All right. Hello, hello, hello. Can you guys hear me okay? Can anybody hear me? I can hear you. We can hear you. Awesome. Mark. Hello. I'm going to know your voice. I'm going to make you a moderator. I think that allows you to share your screen. Hopefully that didn't just kick you out. I don't know. You disappeared from it. So, hello, everybody. We're getting used to this new um, platform here that we've got going on with Circle, which is where we host the WG Cat Plus Mastermind community. So, we're, we're trying out their video feature for a lot of this stuff. A lot of you guys have seen the community and whatnot. Um, Mark, you disappeared when I made you moderator. I don't need you to disappear. I need you to come back. <laughs> Mark said uh, he's here. Yeah, he was here. And then let's remove him as moderator. See if that means he can come back. Let's rewind our steps here. Uh, you guys should have a camera toggle on button. You guys want to come on camera. We love those kind of interactions. So if you can come back on. Mark, you're back. I see you again. Hello. I don't know what just happened, but there, there you are. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I don't know what happened either, but uh, I'm, I'm, um, I'm not sure what happened. I could hear you. I could, you know, I'm still able to hear and see you and everything. And I was chatting okay. in the chat box, but uh, uh, I, right. I, apparently, no one else could hear or see me. So. That was weird. Thank you for uh, everybody for allowing us to get used to this uh, new technology that we're trying out. Mark, I got to ask you a question, though. At the bottom of your screen, is there a toggle screen sharing ah, button? There is, yeah. All right. So I think we're going to be good. It's going to be very much cool. like, like Zoom. So um, we'll have people trickling in and out. Julie, I see you. Uh, if you can help us moderate the chat as well. Mandy. Michael, good to see you too. Ross, Xavier, man, a lot of familiar faces. It's good. This is good. All the class act here. It's great. I mean, could you ask for a better crowd? That's it. I don't know. <laughs> um, well, we're, we are one past our time. So we are recording. And my daughter's inter interrupting me. Can you listen to Good. Okay. All right. So we are one past and uh, Mark, no stranger to the W2 Capitalist Mastermind or community, man, I would love to just turn things over to you and let's talk about legacy wealth. Let's talk about uh, what we're doing. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, best thing I can say is we've got um, a lot of things happening. I think part of the uh, presentation today is going to be on legacy. Part of it's going to be on um, the current banking crisis. Uh, so I've prepared to sort of talk about both of those things together today uh, because they were they are related. There's a lot there, a lot of inter intertwined nature here. So the the it's hard to leave a legacy when banks are failing. Let's just say it that way. Yeah, um, <laughs> absolutely. And that's not just if you have your money in a savings account. You know, that's if you've got money anywhere. Uh, except for a couple of places that we're going to talk some about together today. 
But uh, you know, it's really hard to value a piece of real estate when banks aren't ready to to lend because they're not open for business. Yeah. For example. So, um, I'm I'm really happy to be here. Uh, and Jay, thank you for having me come on and speak to the group. It's an incredible community, an incredible mastermind that you're creating, and it's really a testament to your like like servant heart and your ability to to think what does this community really need from me today in this year in this month and i love the idea of having different themes uh you and i talked otherwise about um how our community not your average financial community has a, a theme each month and we go through our periodic table of abundance uh, which uh, sometimes can lead people to post-traumatic science class disorder um, and so i understand if you know, using the idea of a metaphor of a periodic table of abundance is not exactly great, but it's a lot like the periodic table of elements uh, because every month we go through a different element in the financial universe. And, you know, for right now, it's it's been one of my favorite things to do to help people think through uh, how, to, how to have a, a truly abundant life. We don't want to just be doing stocks if it's important also to remember that we need to be thinking about real estate, for example. We don't want to just think about asset classes, but we also need to think about how do we get our mindset straight so that we can scale up our mindset to grow to a bigger and bigger, a more abundant future. Not just net worth, but fully a wealthy life, W-E-L-L-T-H-Y. So um, that's one of the tools in that uh, abundant periodic table is estate planning and legacy building. And another is banking. And I think they are related to each other. It's like H2, H and O, right? H2O creates water. When you combine the two science elements of hydrogen and oxygen, you get these, you know, this incredible thing called water. Well, I think, honestly, there's a relationship between your legacy and how you handle banking, how you handle banking. Uh, so that's what we're going to be talking about some together today. So, and and we did not all, that. well, I'm just going to say, we didn't expect to go back to science class. So thank you for <laughs> ruling us in. You, know, you and I did, did talk about the, uh, the periodic tables of element, periodic table of elements, I think is, mm -hmm. is what it is. And it is an interesting concept that we're adopting here in the community. Every month we're talking about a specific topic. You know, we're talking about legacy wealth today. In November, we're going to be talking about family. We're trying, we're almost planned that far out. And every time I talk to folks about, hey, let's talk about family. How can I present to the community? A lot of it comes back to the legacy wealth. So maybe we get a double dose of this here mm -hmm. this month. And then also in um, November, I had a very interesting conversation with your guy, Frank uh, Divers, about the, uh, or Divers, Divers. Um, you have to forgive me. I'm from Alabama, so I pronounce words exactly how they're spelled. So I know that's, that's right. not right sometimes. But um, we had a very interesting conversation about estate planning and will preparation and stuff like that that all ties into this. Oh, great. I'm particularly, I'm particularly excited or interested to hear. I haven't heard you talk about the banking crisis. Uh, I did. I've you know, we had all that scare earlier this year with was it SVB, if I'm getting the acronym correct. Mm -hmm. Um, I saw something the other day, uh, probably a couple of weeks ago where a couple of the Wells Fargo banks were saying, Hey, we're limiting withdrawals to a thousand bucks. Like they had it posted on the front door. Oh, now that, that could have been, you know, uh, uh, faults. Uh, I don't know, but, uh, it was yep. interesting. It got me to thinking about this. So I'm, 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 I'm ready to, I'm ready to dive in here. What you mm -hmm. got to say about this? Rock and roll. Yeah. Sweet. So I'm going to share my screen. We'll get into this, guys. I think there's uh, plenty to talk about, so we'll have plenty of time for Q&A at the end as well. So hopefully you're seeing it. it looks like we're seeing the screen here. Let's go ahead and jump on in. And as That's always, it. Jay, please feel free to uh, interrupt or pull me over, and let's make sure that your comments and any questions are answered. So we're going to be I talking will. about legacy wealth and uh, how we can bank on the crisis. See what I did there? Yeah pretty cool and by the way my my whole side of the family is all from alabama too so you know we'll just we'll call it like you see it <laughs> I got when you. it comes to spelling so um yeah all right cool so we are we were just talking about the banking crisis and i think a lot of the headlines are kind of be behind us now you know we're not hearing about bank crises in the headlines and that was just a few months ago so isn't it interesting that we had these mega banks failing 
and yet you know banks are no longer in all the headlines but honestly did they really fix the problem or is there was it just sort of papered over was it just sort of papered over uh, so first, let's get some statistics on the table. The federally insured banks across the country have about 18 to $20 trillion in assets. That's so much money. We can't even fathom how much money that is, 18 to $20 trillion. That's, and, and almost half of those are uninsured monies. That means it's above the FDIC insured limit of $250,000. That means half of all the money in the bank accounts um, are uninsured. Now, uh, Janet Yellen has assured the American public that they'll make depositors whole, even if they have a bank that fails, even if their bank account balances over a quarter million. But that would be done on a case-by-case -case circumstance, and basically they would just give priority to any system systemically important banks, which are really just 10 banks out of the 4,200 banks across the country. So what does that tell everybody who's listening to do? What's the, what's the smart money going to do? If, if we are not sure if your bank is systemically important or not, you're going to look it up and then what are you going to do? You're probably going to go to a mega bank, but all your, the smart money is going to be moving all their money to a mega bank, closing out their credit unions and their smaller regional banks. In fact, it's the regional banks that seem to have the most trouble in the springtime. If you're like many small businesses, you're probably carrying more than 250,000 in your bank balance. It's surprising to say that. Um, you know, maybe not many who are just running their, getting their bills paid and scratching out a living, but it does not take a whole lot to run a business and have a balance of over a quarter million at all times in your in your bank balance. So there's a lot of incentive for business owners, especially, to move to the the mega bank. So that they can be a part of that systemically important cool crowd. Uh, and if the banks go under, their money is safe with a mega bank. Or is it? Or is it? Is it really good for you or for the country to have all of our money in 10 banks? How does that sound? You know, the more they can hoover up our bank balances and cut out small credit unions and mid-sized regionals, the more power these mega banks can accumulate. And I guess I wonder too, are banks even really the real crisis happening here? Or is there something else more nefarious going on? I hate to sound like a tinfoil hat here. Again, as a certified financial planner, I don't wear my tinfoil hat, at least not to bed. Uh, I, I usually keep it in my side drawer here in my office desk. Uh, but <laughs> <You're> killing <laughs> me, Mark. Yeah. But uh, like I say, the, the banks, as we know them, are not the real impending crisis. The real danger comes from something called non-bank institutions. Now, these are financial firms other than banks that do all kinds of financial services, including lending to businesses. Um, and generally speaking, these are what's known as shadow banks. Uh, and I don't know who comes up with these cool names, but, uh, you know, I think it'd be really cool to, to you know, have some sort of like a, a Marvel movie with like the shadow banker or something like that. That'd be so cool to, to throw that villain in there, uh, mostly just to see him get beat up and defeated by the good guys. But Non-banks are going to be things like pension funds, mutual funds, peer-to-peer -peer lending, high-risk hedge funds. These are all lending money, but they're not actually a bank. So that's what we mean by shadow banks. Now, the total amount of money on the books with these, you guys want to take a guess? Throw it in the chat. Somebody put a number on what is the total market value of all the yeah, all the market value of all the assets on these uh, balance sheets for all these um, non-banks, shadow banks. What do you guys think? Anybody have any guesses? Uh, my question is, does it fall into that number you gave us earlier, the uh, 18 to... Oh, yeah. No, these are... To... So that's the banks. That's the bank balances there. Oh, okay. So, this so is these a different are number. shadow banks. Yeah. What do the non-banks hold in terms of total assets? What do you guys think? $14, $17. <laughs> I think it's going to be more than more than what you said earlier. Javier says uh, $10 to... trillion. Dollars. Whoa. All yeah. right. Anybody ready for this? Anybody else want to throw in? It might just I, be gonna, a prize. For the I'm going to go, I'm going to go 20, 20 trillion. Oh, we got 20. Do we got 21 trillion? 21. Yeah. Anybody going to do prices right here? All right. Well, I just going to say 
I saw Nick put in a one million in the chat. Nick, the one dollar price is right rule does not work here. It's not. It's just the closest, right? That's what we're doing. Yep. Right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> one million. <laughs> Way to go, Julia. That's awesome. Sweet. Okay. Well, the answer is two hundred thirty-nine yeah. trillion dollars. Holy smokes, that is almost unfathomable. That's almost half of the world's wealth when you add it all up. And that none of that is FDIC insured. None of that has any kind of insurance at all. If it all blows up overnight, if the entire house, if, if the entire world, let's say, was your home, would you feel comfortable having half of your home not insured in, if there was a fire? How would mm. that feel, right? That's a risky bet right there. So what is shadow banking? Again, if they're taking up half the world's assets and have no protection, we might want to know what's going on there. So they're making loans to riskier borrowers without the same oversight or transparency as a typical bank. That's generally what they're doing. These institutions are adding significant risk to the world economy. There's a real lack of regulation and oversight since they're so interconnected to the traditional financial system. They're bringing this really increased systemic risk to the global financial system. If they fail, it would trigger a serious chain reaction of financial losses, contagion that would really spread around the whole world. And again, with that balance of $239 trillion, it would be really impossible, impossible to control that meltdown of that particular sector and cause the global economy to collapse in many major ways. Now, there's a book out there called Debt to the First 5,000 Years, and you guys may have heard me talk about this book before, but it's a good one. I mean, we're all experiencing unprecedented times right now, <laughs> but it's actually not that unprecedented. The book is literally called Debt the First 5,000 Years. It's an author uh, named David Graeber, and it's one of my favorite books I've read in the last few years. It, I don't agree with everything in the book, but you know, it really talks quite a bit about this four-letter word, debt, D-E-P-T. DBT, right? How much pain is that four-letter word caused? All the problems, the emotional pain, the the divorces, the you know lost opportunities, the suicides, even God forbid. And on the same side of the coin, there's two sides to every coin. What about how much wealth has that four-letter word created for those who truly understood its power? I mean, isn't that power now increasing? With $239 trillion, aren't banking crises becoming more and more and more common? You think about it, right? Think back over just the last 30 years or so. Didn't we just have a huge banking crisis <laughs> in 2008? What about in 1997, the Asian financial crisis? What about the 1980s savings and loans crisis? And before that, when Brenton Woods and that system collapsed and we went off the gold standard? And even before that, the Great Depression? I mean, this is all under the watch of the Federal Reserve. <laughs> you're, you're going. I was going to ask you uh, while we're recommending books. Do you recommend people read uh, the Creature from Jekyll Island? Ooh, man, yeah. Tell us about that. What have you read that book or dug into it some? I have. Uh, it got recommended to me to by a couple of the Mastermind members, and uh, now it's a long book. It's 24 hours on Audible, and that's the only way that I'll consume yep. a book these days. And uh, it was hard for me to stop reading it, and I, it was it was really uh, opportunistic. I was reading it the same time the SVP uh, or SVB crisis was going Whoa. down, whatnot. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, all right, well, if this book's accurate, next week here's what's going to happen. And next week, here's what's happened. You know, and it, it was like, wow. All right. So this is, it's interesting. I'll, I'll uh, I see Julia put the link in the book for uh, a link wow, in the chat right for uh, debt. The first 5,000 years, I'll, I'll put the one in there for uh, the Jekyll Island. I'm loving the, it, so. I'm loving the memes there. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. That's a, that is a game changing book. Again, I'm not trying to scare, but we need to understand <laughs> that, <laughs> Banks are, are an integral part of the human experience. I mean, if they've been around for 5,000 years, and that's basically what David Graeber is claiming, they look different than they do today. But there is core to the human experience as marriage. There is core to the human experience as, you know, friendship or whatever. So, you know, banking is a central piece to the, the experience of human life. So we might as well figure out how to do it. Uh, and I don't know what else to say except you know, be on the right side of the leverage 
because banking will continue to exist, I believe, well past, um, you know, more, you know, new, nuanced financial strategies that, that we experience today. So again, the banking function is crucial to your legacy because you'll either help build your wealth or you're going to help build the banker's wealth. And there's really no, no in between there. You know, again, I, I'm kind of, uh, I'm, I, I regularly say, and I don't know if I've heard this from someone else, they say that creativity is just forgetting your sources. Uh, but, you know, whoever controls the banking function in your life is going to win the money game. They're going to win this, this Saturday night because it's either you're working for the banker or he's working for you. And they're going to win when you pass away because most of the wealth that goes out of your hands will either go to your family or to the bank. I want it to go to your family. I think they can, your family needs it more than the banker does. So that's, we're dealing with serious stuff here. All right, so the Federal Reserve. Officially, the Federal Reserve was supposed to keep us from all this madness that we've gone through the last 100 years or so. But it's as, as if it uh, continues, the, the banking crises, just the cycle has just continued one after the other. We don't even remember many crises before 1929 banking, you know, in the Great Depression. In fact, it's it's almost like uh, the banking crisis that we're living through today was either inevitable or on purpose, and I don't I don't claim one or the other there. Uh, but many banks are actually, especially the big ones, are positioned to profit from all of this consolidation that we're seeing as banks buy other banks, and J.P. Morgan picks up another bank here this week, and then next week it's another bank. Um, so these largest banks are really beginning to build up more and more power. Uh, but the not so average Joe on the street like guys like you and me, Jay, and everybody else on here, we're wondering, well, hey, what, what's the problem? You know, why do they keep getting us into this trouble? Why are we consistently hearing about banks closing on the headlines? Well, you know, there's this thing called fractional reserve banking. And that's been in place for decades now, but would anybody here, Jay, or anybody else be willing to give a go at what is fractional reserve banking? Any guesses on what that is or how that works? You Anybody get in the chat. Serious kudos if you know how to how it works. Annette, Mike, I, I I know you guys know Nick. Anybody? All right, Mark. For for some reason, never heard. I've heard of the term. I just don't know exactly what it what it is. To be honest. So. Okay. Xavier, Nick, yeah. you guys are pretty close. That's to that, it. Yeah. Right? Wow, that's really good. Both of you guys, way to go. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, essentially, through this process of fractional reserve banking, banks are allowed to create money out of nothing. It's like that old song. Who sings it? Uh, money for nothing, checks for free. Um, yeah, it's kind of like that. You know, essentially, they have this interaction between the depositor and the borrower that creates this fraction of the actual money and that creates money out of thin air, in essence. So, for example, if a bank has $100 of Jay's deposit, they're only required to keep, uh, traditionally it's about 10 bucks of Jay's deposit is left on the books at the vault in the vault of the bank. And they lend out $90 to me if I need a loan. Now the beautiful thing for banks is, Jay, they're paying you what, a, a nickel in interest? Maybe? Um, yeah, not a whole lot. Yeah. Let, it's, it's like 0. 0.005%. That's about a nickel. Yeah, that's about right. In the meantime, with my, with your money, they're charging me whatever, 10%, 18%. Credit cards averaging 24% this year. I just saw a 12% HELOC for the first time just the other day. So that's that's an infinite return if you think about it. The banks are using Jay's money to loan to me paying him nothing essentially and they're charging me a, a boat ton right uh, so this this impact can be huge a few things happen when when fractional reserve banking is is uh, deployed first of all it injects fake money into the economy because Jay still thinks he has his hundred dollars in savings and I think I have a, a nine hundred dollar or whatever a ninety dollar loan or whatever that's that's not really there you know they didn't have that money to lend out it's a it's like a, a Ponzi scheme in many ways. It's literally, that's how it works. Uh, so again, this is not, this is, check all this out, 
right? I'm not uh, going anywhere that's not on official record with banks. They they report this. They they have to. So it creates this sort of uh, cycle. But this gets really crazy. So this process continues as long as people keep borrowing and as people keep depositing money. Each time the banks lend it out again, you know, lending out 90% of the new deposits, holding back 10% as reserves. This means if you have a thousand bucks in the bank, they'll create a ten thousand dollar um, fake amount of money. So again, if you have a thousand dollars deposited, that means for every thousand dollars, the bank will create ten thousand dollars of money that doesn't actually exist. So take a minute. You don't have to write this into the chat, but what is your current bank balance? Think about your personal bank account balance. Okay, got it in your mind? Look it up if you're not sure. As long as it's a positive number, and I hope it is. <laughs> um, what is your bank balance? If you have a bank account, and I do, and we all do, then we're all contributing to this problem of fractional reserve banking. Now, what is the problem? Well, it's it's a more fragile system. Fractional reserve banking has this potential to make our system a lot more fragile. It stretches out the, the money base, the monetary base, beyond what is actually there. And by allowing banks to loan out money they don't actually have, you know, we can see this situation where the banking system sort of becomes a house of cards, right? People begin to withdraw their money en masse like they did in the spring. That's what happened with um, you know, with Silicon Valley. Many of the people began pulling money out and Silicon Valley had simply just put the done what they were supposed to do and put their money into the safe, safe treasury bills. Uh, but when people were pulling money out of that bank faster than they really could uh, pay off those other other borrowers could pay off the loans that made the bank totally insolvent overnight. This is a very fragile system. So fractional reserve banking uh, creates, first of all, it lends out money to people that probably should not get the loans. Think about it. When you're when you're gambling with other people's money, you can basically lend out to more and more people, people who probably shouldn't have gotten a loan in the first place, right? You know, it's like, um, like I, I keep trying to get this million dollar bank loan, Jay, for this business idea. And I wonder if you guys would be willing to invest with me. You see, it's it's um, glow in the dark sunglasses. I'm, I'm thinking those will really take off someday. Glow in the dark sunglasses. And um, the other idea I have for a million dollar business, and I'm ready for your investments. You know, I'll be collecting investments here soon. So opening it up to investors. It's a, a doorless microwave. That's my idea. What do you guys think? Doorless <laughs> microwaves, glow-in-the-dark sunglasses. And I was thinking, too, what about green golf balls? I think those will really take off. Green golf yeah. balls, you know, making them super easy to, you know, no one else will have a green golf ball, guys. You won't lose any of them, I promise. Yeah. <laughs> These yeah. are all business ideas that are doomed to failure because, but they'll all get loans because the banks are lending out money that's not really theirs. So. Yeah, and, and something, too, that I didn't realize until recently, probably in the last couple of years, is those bank reps that uh, most of them have VP in front of their names if we're dealing with commercial lenders. They have sales quotas, right? They, they are not sitting back waiting. Most of them are not sitting back waiting and for somebody just to walk in the bank, but they actually have sales quotas that mm -hmm. they actually have to go out and find. And... I, I just can't imagine being in their position to go out and find a deal that has to fit this criteria and then how much maybe they're tweaking the underwriting just to make a sales quota. Yeah. Uh, so, to make their sales quota. So I don't know. Big time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Nick writes, you might glow in the dark That's if good. you have a doorless microwave. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I'm glad. So I'm glad you were paying attention to those, Nick. Okay, cool. Yeah. That's just, one of those uh, added features and benefits. We can incorporate that into our marketing pitch. How about that? <laughs> but again, the point is they're gambling with our money. How many people have worked hard to deposit their money? Our savings rates are so small already. The average savings rate in this country is 3% of our incomes. And the little bit of money we can scratch together and put in the bank, that then becomes you know, loaned out. And these banks are taking massive profits off those uh, off those small deposits that we're all making, okay? So, you know, some might say that fractional reserve banking has some benefits. I mean, they're lending out to more and more people this way, so that's good. It's encouraged investment. But are we really lending money to people if we don't actually have it to lend? That would be my response. 
And as far as uh, as far as this goes, I'd say this is why we have a very fragile system right now. So what? So why does any of this matter? What does this have to do with you? Well, again, you can profit from this system, the same system that banks are enjoying right now. Where is it written that only mega banks or even any bank can do this, but you can't? Now, first step is we can opt out of the banking system. First of all, if you're ready to opt out of all this madness, uh, one of the most interesting alternatives to the banking system is the life insurance industry. Strange enough, life insurance companies are ready to accept capital just like banks are ready to accept deposits. Now, when you send money to a bank, you call that a deposit. And that means it acts different than when you send it to a life insurance company. When you send money to life insurance companies, they call that premium. And most people, when they hear the word life insurance, they think, oh, yeah, that's the money I'm paying in case I croak. Well, that's true. But if it's cash value life insurance, then there's a lot of other things that happen when you send premium in to a cash value policy. And we can get into some of what this is. But um, in essence, you know, when you put money into a cash value life insurance policy, like like a bank on yourself designed whole life insurance policy that we talk about, well, that money does not get inflated. You know, insurance companies are not allowed to inflate the money supply like banks do. Remember, what is the business of a bank? The bank, you know what, you know, maybe you have a business where you sell hammers, your hardware store. OK, you sell hammers and nails and screws and all that. You're in the business of selling hammers and nails and screws. Well, a bank, they don't sell hammers and nails and screws. They sell debt. That's their business. They sell debt. Banks accept deposits and then they make loans. That's the business they're in. Life insurance companies sell life insurance. That's what's on their shop store walls. It's life insurance contracts. So banks are there to operate as a bank. Life insurance uh, companies will pay claims, collect premiums, pay claims, collect premiums. That's the business that they're in. So life insurance companies are looking at this as a lifelong choice. When you put money into a life insurance contract, they're not seeing it as get in, get out, like a savings account or a checking account. They see you putting money into that contract and they know that you're keeping it there for a long time, maybe your entire life. And so this means that insurance companies have to keep a lot of money in cash on reserve to meet these obligations. There's some contractual guarantees on these cash value policies. For instance, the money, the wealth in the policy, it's, again, it's called cash value, grows on a guaranteed basis every single year. And there's really nothing that we can do to stop it. The stock market can't crash it, the bond market can't crash it. Real estate, if it crashes, the whole life insurance still grows every single year. Last year, 2022, stocks were down. Bonds were down, which is anathema to most financial advisors. How can both of those be down at the same time? Real estate was getting weak. You know, there was supply chain shocks. You know, it was it was like, where do we hide our cash last year? And yet, all of the policies that my clients hold, all of them, Every one of them hit an all-time record high last year. How does that feel, right? So that's how life insurance companies work. They're working on a different time horizon than, say, your typical bank deposits would be. So you can opt out of the failing banking system that causes so much pain. You can be part of the solution with a life insurance contract. All right. So again, if if uh, a life insurance company receives 50 grand from you, let's say that you have a cash value in your policy of 50,000 bucks. Well, you've got a $500,000 death benefit, let's say as well. Okay. So because of this, the insurance company has to be ready to go to pay out that 500 grand death benefit, which means they cannot just be being, um, you know, uh, foolish with your 50,000 bucks you gave them. They need to keep that plus more on cash reserve. More than $50,000 has to be held in reserve in case you need to, you know, graduate on us tonight. If you pass away tonight, they need to be ready to pay not 50 grand, but 500 grand to your family. Let's, let's, let's back up. No, no graduations tonight. That's or right. Week from anybody. <laughs> no, no early graduations here. <laughs> that's right. You got to have a little bit of gallows humor to do this kind of work, but yes, that's, 
That's exactly right. We don't want any of that happening. Stay on this side of the grass, please. Um, we need you around. So, um, yeah, anybody have any questions or comments, Jay? Any other comments on, on the difference between banks and life insurance companies and, and what their business is? I, Annette, did you yes, raise your hand? Yes, I have a question. Okay. Um, so if they don't loan the money the way banks do, how do they make money? Life insurance. Uh, great companies. question. Yeah, great question. How do they make money if, if they're not loaning it out? Well, they do loan it out. They loan out some of your money, but they do not loan out your money. They loan it out uh, the money that is not necessarily kept in cash. So to keep a, keep this real simple, and I have got a whole drawing. Would it help to, if we have time for it, I will go into a deep answer of that question at the end, Annette. Is that, is that fair? Sure. Okay, so but the shorter answer, just to answer your question, uh, they have to keep your cash value plus more in cash, like money market accounts and things like that, simple cash accounts, so that they can pay those death benefits. Uh, they are not loaning out your money because they have to keep that money liquid to satisfy uh, death claims should someone pass away. And also, since they're audited by the state insurance commissioners and by third parties like AM Best and Fitch and Standard and Poor and these other third party rating agencies, they need to have their um, books audited regularly to make sure they're in compliance to even be a life insurance company. So they cannot be doing all this foolishness that you see banks doing, getting into all this trouble, which is why Can in I 2008, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I know you've, you've said this statistic before. I can't remember the actual numbers. How many banks have failed in the last 100 years? And then how many life insurance companies have failed in the last 100 years? I don't know about 100 years. I can tell you in 2008. I could look that your question up. I'm sure someone could, could search for that. But okay. in 2008, it was an impressively large, several hundred banks went bankrupt. I can get the exact number if you need, but it's it was it was somewhere between three and four hundred and fifty banks went bankrupt in two thousand eight. So we've had like six banks this spring. Can you imagine four hundred plus banks going bankrupt in one year? Hmm. That's why they call it the global financial crisis. It was so huge. Now, as far as I can tell, no mutual life insurance companies went bankrupt in two thousand eight. Zero. Now there was one privately held tiny little insurance company called Lincoln Memorial Life that went bankrupt in 2008. But I wouldn't have worked with them in the first place. They were so young. They had their balance sheet was still getting started. And what happened to them though? What happened? You know, was everybody okay over there? What happened with that company? The state insurance commissioner of Texas operated the business for that little insurance company. And they just basically moved all the business, all the policies went over to Banner Life. Now, I don't like Banner Life much either. They're, I'm sure they're fine for certain things, but I don't use them for bank on yourself. But that's what happened. Essentially, people got to keep getting that contractual guaranteed increase of their wealth just coming from Banner. The, the logo at the top of their annual checks changed from Lincoln Memorial to Banner Life. That's basically the, the big extent of it. So um, that's sort of the impressive difference between how banks handled a, a crisis and how life insurance companies did. I mean, you think about it, there should have been a ton of, um, we just went through a stinking pandemic and yet I don't see any bankruptcies on these life insurance companies. Right. Right. So, all right. Good stuff, man. Great question. Anybody else? All right. Well, there's this type of bank out there that I've been digging into. It's kind of cool. Uh, it's called full reserve banking. And I still have a checking account, okay? After all I've just said about banks, I still use, I have to use a checking account for groceries and whatever. There are some banks out there that are trying to get what's called full reserve banking going. And, you know, that's essentially where all of your money is actually there. Go figure, go figure. You put in a thousand bucks, it's it's all there. A thousand bucks is in the vault, so to speak. Now, what if, uh, what if we just had 10% of America doing this? What if just 10% of the world adopted bank on yourself and full reserve banking practices? How cool would that be? You know, you'd solve the banking crisis overnight. You might not even need a federal reserve. You might not even need an FDIC, which by the way, by the way, uh, I'll just be brief on this, but 
when Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank went bankrupt, when they provided full restitution for the depositors, even those who had balances above a quarter million, that depleted completely the FDIC. And I don't know if you guys remember, but Janet Yellen and all these guys said that it's not a bank bailout. We're not bailing out the banks. Well, okay, that's cool. We bailed out the depositors, but now what's happening? Sure, we didn't have a taxpayer bailout, but now the FDIC is empty. It only had 1% reserves anyway of all the nation's bank deposits, which is kind of scary. 1% of banks fail all the time, right? But in, the, in, in this new world, we now have an empty tank over at the FDIC. So what the banks have to do to be a member of FDIC is pay a bunch of insurance into the FDIC. So in other words, to be a member of F, uh, FDIC, the bank has to pay a big check to fill in the, the, the vault over there at the FDIC. Where does that money come from? I'll let you guess. Where does all the money come from where the banks have to th shovel money into the FDIC? Who's giving them that money? What do you guys think? I'll give you a clue. Grab a mirror. <laughs> Deposits. <laughs> yeah, depositors, right? Yeah. So, you know, you're getting a lower interest on your on your bank deposits and you're getting higher interest on your bank loans so that the banks can take all your money, hoover it up and dump it into the FDIC so they can do another crisis and and look like the, you know, white knight coming to rescue again. So anyway, so that is uh, what if what if we didn't have any of that nonsense and we just had 10 percent, just 10 percent of us, just one in 10 of us did full reserve banking. That'd be so cool. What it might lower divorce rates. It might improve mental yeah. health outcomes. You know, it might uh, in increase the great you know, the financial responsibility, there'd be less reliant on credit in this country. Um, you know, there's there's whole studies out there, Journal of American Medical Association says that you have a 30% increase of early death if you lose 100 grand on average. They call it a wealth shock. It's a medical term called a wealth shock. And it shocks me that we don't all just sort of notice the relationship between health and wealth. Okay, so is all this wishful thinking? Am I just, you know, some sort of idealist? Um, I don't know. You know, I, I certainly don't think banks are going to obviously change their minds about how they're profiting off of our backs. You know, they certainly have a vested interest in the status quo. Uh, they've been profiting richly. It's difficult to convince something of some of something. It's di excuse me. It's difficult. This is the Upton Sinclair paradox. Um, Upton Sinclair says. It's difficult to convince someone of something when their salary is dependent on them not being convinced. And I love that because that's how banks are living right now. They they are living high on the hog and they know it. And so they're not going to be really incentivized to change their structure. But let's take a look. Where do banks put their money? Where are they putting their money? Well, in uh, in just 2019, last data I could find, just four banks, just four banks placed $54 billion in cash value life insurance, $54 billion. Bank of America alone, just that bank by itself, has more money in cash value life insurance than all of their real estate value combined. That shocked me when I found that out. So what do they know that we don't? It increases stability of their balance sheet. It's part of their tier one capital. It decreases the bank's taxes and increases their capital without unnecessary risk. And it's a perfect place to place uh, future liabilities or employee benefit packages. You know that some of these major executive bank executives have these mega policies on their lives. I'm, I'll pull over again, but uh, let me wrap this one up first. Then we'll talk. We'll pull over for any questions for a few minutes. And I've got a little bit more if we have time for it. Corporate owned life insurance. Again, this has been solving banks and, uh, excuse me, this has been solving the cash needs of businesses for generations. We could talk from everyone from, you know, um, J.C. Penney, James Penney in the Great Depression used his life insurance to keep his business afloat. Walt Disney borrowed from his life insurance to fund the construction of Disneyland in California. Uh, Doris Christopher used a life insurance policy loan to start the Pampered Chef, and then she sold it to Warren Buffett for $500 million dollars few years later, uh, I just learned that uh, the guy who started uh, Dungeons and Dragons used his life insurance to start the game. 
to finance the operations of his game. And then there's mega corporations that use this all the time too. In fact, 68% of Fortune 1000 companies use life insurance to fund executive retirement plans. These are not 401ks, they're executive retirement plans. Um, technically, they're called 162 plans to create predictable income. Uh, there's a great book, by the way, The Pirates of Manhattan. I'd recommend check that one out. So what do they know that we refuse to learn, right? Banks and corporations seem to get it. Let me pull over for a minute. Anybody have any feedback, comments, insights, questions? Oh, thanks, Julia. That's a cool meme. There, that's neat. I love that quote, Mark. Um, also never heard of the term wealth shock. Hey, you lose 100000 you can almost guarantee you're going to the grave early. That's yeah. impressive. That's impressive. It's There's an actual a, medical term. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it blew me away when I saw that. But um, yeah, it's in the Journal of American Medical Association, JAMA. It's like the highly regarded medical journal in the United States. And that's what they called it. You know, and some oh. people lost more, some lost less than a hundred, but it was a, it's, it was termed a significant loss over a short period of time. So it could have been a, a market downturn or a divorce, but something that caused them that wealth shock. And there's a real relationship between, you know, your life expectancy and losing money. So the key would be like Warren Buffett says, first rule, do not lose money. I think rule number two is look at rule number one, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yep, and and don't die early. That's a great rule number two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, rock on. Don't forget rule number one, Nick. That's great, man. Thank you. All right. Anybody else? Any feedback, comments? What's not clear? Okay, so this will blow you away. What I'm going to show you next, and I see our time. We got what do we have left? Ten minutes? Five minutes? We got fifteen. If you, want to go to okay. full, right. if you want to go to the full hour, yep. Yep, and I'll uh, hopefully leave it open for some discussion at the end too. And, okay. Um, so Texas, we just talked about banks know about this. Corporations know about this. Well, Texas billionaires like this too. <laughs> One guy in particular, I won't mention names, he agreed to pay $1.2 million a month, a month in premium into a whole life insurance policy for about 10 years. $1.2 million a month over 12 months. That's $14.4 million a year. And he had a $144 million cash value in 10 years. Oh, wow. That's awesome. $144 million bones in 10 years. After-tax dollars, guys. These are after-tax money. So this means that the IRS won't come after his income when he pulls that money out of that policy. He'll be tax-exempt forever. Why did he do this? Did he need some life insurance? Some people think that they'll just be so wealthy someday that they'll just self-insure, quote unquote. Well, this guy was a billionaire. Why did he buy this? Well, sure, he might like the death benefit, but he'll be able to take in retirement $10 million every year for the rest of his life tax-free. And remember, when you take out $10 million out of your life insurance policy, it has nowhere to be reported on the IRS tax return. So that's like secret money. I don't want to say secret money because, you know, that's I don't like using that <laughs> word secret, but it's not reported. It's camouflaged. It's it's private. What you do with your policy is not reported to the IRS. Some people say, well, wait a minute, Mark, wait a minute. Everybody knows you should never put money into life insurance. But well, then why do banks and corporations and billionaires do it? Right. Seems to me the big banks are doing well. Corporations are still hitting record profits and billionaires keep getting richer. Maybe we should learn something from them. Right. So let's do the math on this. What was the tax rate on the $10 million per year? That was 37% was where he's at. You know, he's he's uh, as he takes the money out of out of his policy, he would have been taxed at 37% if this was in a 401k. Well, 37% of 10 million is 3.7 million bucks. So that means every year he takes money out of his life insurance, he's saving 3.7 million in taxes every single year. Now, what if taxes go up on the billionaires like Congress would love to do? he'll still get $10 million out and he'll save even more on taxes. So this means over 20 years, if taxes don't go up on billionaires or any of us, he'll save $74 million in taxes because, again, he has nowhere to put all that $10 million on his IRS tax forms. So question, how much money would he have to save in retirement plan to get to $10 million net? Well, remember, he'd have to pull out 
out of a 401k, let's say, he'd have to pull out $16 million a year to equal $10 million after tax. Does that make sense, Jay? Do you see where I'm going with this? Absolutely. Yep. Got it? So again, yep. we're doing this efficiently so he doesn't have to pull the money out and pay a bunch of taxes every year as he does it. Now, the re- next question is, well, how much should he have saved if this was a regular market-based 401k? If you could even put this much into a 401k and build up enough, how much would he need to have in a tax-deferred account to equal what he's able to do tax-free with his life insurance? Well, let's find out. Best research says you should not take more than about 3%, 2.8%, 3% withdraw out of your savings for retirement money. So let's do this for a second. How much money? How big a pile would he need to have in order to safely take $16 million out of his 401k or whatever every year? Anybody want to take a guess on this? Again, if you have your calculator handy, just take uh, $16 million, divide by 3%. That's right. He'd need to have $533 million in a 401k or some other taxable account to accomplish what $144 million in his life insurance policy would need to accomplish. If you remember, he had a $144 million in cash value in 10 years. In order to do the same thing with a taxable account, he'd need $533 million saved. Is this starting to make sense? And that's assuming that taxes are not going to go up. That's it, right. They never do, right? Right, exactly. They typically go lower. (laughs) That's right. That's right especially on those billionaires. They never raise those taxes, right? Yeah. But, 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 but wait a minute, Mark, that rate of return sucked, right? In that example, he only got a 0% return after 10 years. You think he cares? For every dollar and 44 he puts in, he gets out $5.33. And that's, a, that's a 0% return, I guess, but that's still a pretty great deal for his money. It's not about the big pile of money. It's about how well it produces a tax-free cash flow and how well it creates a legacy for you. And just like Jay was asking, what if taxes go up? What do you guys think? Do you think taxes might go up? Do you want to pay those taxes? What if taxes go up to 50%? He'd he'd have to grow to not 5 point, you know, 533 million, but 824 million dollars in 10 years. And if he has a 70% tax rate, he'd need to be north of a billion dollars in his 401k. A billion dollars. Now, I get it. If you're like me, I'm not a billionaire yet. Yet. Um, I know, Jay, you're getting pretty close. But uh, uh, I'm not, not quite yet. there yet. Not okay. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's not about the zeros at the end of this example. The point is not the zeros. The point is the concept. So just knock off some zeros if that's distracting you. You know, maybe 144,000 spends like over half a million. If you've got 144 grand in your life insurance policy, it would spend like it's a half a million dollars in a 401k. Does that make sense? All right. So every dollar you have today is a vote. You've maybe heard this before, but I want to re reorient us to a new way of thinking about this. And I encourage you to, to vote. Make your voice heard. Remember, every dollar you have is a vote. So the good news is you can opt out of the current banking system today. And where is it written we have to put all of our money into somebody else's bank? I'm not aware of any law that tells me I have to use somebody else's bank to store my wealth. So one by one, family by family, business by business, people are already opting out of the fractional banking problem with the majority of their wealth. They're voting with their feet, with their dollars. They're building real wealth outside of Wall Street, outside of the banking system. I believe there's never been a bank a better time to talk about bank on yourself than this year, right now. I mean, it fits into the larger framework of the entire financial system. The global financial system will continue to drink from this spiked punch spiked punch bowl of money creation and loose lending practices, but hundreds of thousands of families are throwing down and taking up the gauntlet to become their own source of financing. So I'll just quickly say I had a a client who had a 27-year relationship with a credit union. This seems like a good relationship, you know, 27 years, never once overdrafting on their accounts, regularly making deposits, et cetera. Um, But she and her husband were moving across country. One time they 
forgot to pay a bill or something and, and it overdrafted their account one little time because they were moving, you know, they're a little busy. And it was like moving heaven and earth, she said, just to fix the overdraft fee from that little credit union that she worked with. She complained. The relationship should be reciprocal, she said. And that's true in friendship. It's true in marriage. It's true in family and business. A relationship has to be reciprocal. And it should be the same with your bank. It should be the same with a life insurance company too. In fact, a mutually owned life insurance company, which is how I like to use these policy. I only work with mutually owned companies. Mutually owned means it's owned by you and me, the policyholders. And when you have a mutually owned life insurance company, it's a reciprocal relationship. You know, their job is to create profit and to pay out death claims. Your job is to throw the premiums into the policy. And it's a complete system. It's it's different. It's exactly opposite the broken system of the fractional reserve banking. So again, my bold opinion as I'm wrapping things up, <laughs> if, if you haven't heard it yet, is that you do not have to wait for some act of Congress. You don't have to wait for some law to be passed. You can choose right now, today, to opt out of this system and begin building a family bank. Again, I'm not talking about a literal FDIC insured bank. Thank goodness. <laughs> I'm talking about a bank in the same way you might have a food bank or a, a snow bank, like a pool or reserve of wealth that your family can depend on, you can borrow from. So when you have a bank on your self-designed policy, you have this source of money, you have this capital, you have a contingency fund that you can use for anything that you might need in your life. Then you can loan it out, not just for yourself, but also for other people. In fact, there's a lot of people using their policies right now for bridge loans. Jay, are you, you're very familiar with bridge loans, right? Yes, sir. I just did one myself uh, yeah. with our policy um, a couple of weeks ago. Come on. Absolutely. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll wrap my little thoughts up and then I want to hear that story. Okay. Uh, this is my, okay. I think my last slide. So uh, bridge loans, big project. You can be your own banker, but you can also be everybody else's banker like Jay is. Banker Jay, I like the sound of that. We can use it for college education, other personal family needs. You can use it for real estate investing. Again, the reason why we think of this as, as um, sort of an infinite concept is the more you see, the more there is to see. And that's really what it's been for me the last 12 years of doing this. The more you see, the more there is to see. It's like, you know, the the, the matrix in many ways. I know that might be an overused metaphor, but, you know, it is sort of like going down the rabbit hole when you start to learn about how banks really work. So anyway, if you'd like to dig into how this would work in your situation, the best thing you can do is give us a call. We can help. We can help opt out of the banking system. And you can speak with me or one of my colleagues. We can answer your questions about how Bank on Yourself really works on a you and me level. And uh, you can go to our website, which is w2capitalist.com slash bank. W2, W, the number two, capitalist.com slash bank. And we can answer your questions. We can do a 15-minute phone call, see if this tool might be of help to you. Annette, I see your hand is raised. Mark, thank you very much. I, I know you're going to open it up for Q&A, and then depending on how long we go, we, we're going to go with this, I've got something I want to ask you about and share with you if we have time. I think yeah, everybody cool. here is going to benefit from seeing that. So, Annette, you had a question? Yes. One quick question. The bank on yourself policy, um, I know it's different from universal and whole insurance. And I know, can you explain that quickly? Sure. Quickly. Um, the chassis undergirding whole life insurance is categorically different than the chassis undergirding index universal life insurance. Um, the shortest way I can describe it is that index universal life insurance has an internal expense that goes up every year. It's like renting an apartment that you can never break the lease on. And the landlord has the right to raise the rent on you every single year for the rest of your life. That's how Index Universal Life Insurance works. Now, I'm not a fan of that chassis, not for this purpose of bank on yourself. Whole life insurance does not have that internal expense feature that gets more expensive every year. I've got some charts on that, but we probably don't have time to get into it too much, but that's a great question. Thank you. We and could have a whole other. Mark... We could have a whole other <laughs> session on that, uh, Jay. And I think I told you, Jay, yeah. that, that I've even written a um, a uh, uh, epic rap battle between whole life and yeah. universal life insurance. 
Yeah, we were, we were talking about maybe getting you in the universal life, somebody who's very pro universal life uh, policies on uh, doing a rap battle between mm-hmm. that. One of the and when you and I were talking about that, um, you let me know that universal life has the ability, and I don't even like the word using that word uh, or option to lose value to where your bank and yourself policy does not. That's right. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah kind of scary <laughs> yeah and, and that honestly is guaranteed to happen it's put right into the contract that that does happen and if you oh, look wow. deeply at the in force illustrations of the index universal life you'll see that the cash value st- starts to go down as you age until it finally gets to zero and zero means the mm. whole thing collapses and the you lose everything that's in the policy wow yeah they probably don't highlight that uh no yeah anyway anyway <laughs> Uh, like you said, a whole another segment on the differences, and maybe we'll do that sometime here in the future. Yeah. Um, uh, Michael asked earlier if insurance companies don't loan money out, where do commercial loans from insurance companies come from, like MetLife? Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe it would help for us to see this. So I'll see if I can draw this here or, or illustrate this. Uh, if I can do this quickly. Where do they put the money? How do they do it? They do loan it out, guys. I, I don't want to misspeak here. Uh, so may I share my screen one more time? You bet. And I see I see you our bet. time. So I'm going to try to do this as fast as I can. Okay. Um, maybe this is a mistake for me sharing here, but uh, let me, <laughs> I'll try to be quick here. Okay. I think we're working it here. There we go. All right. So hopefully you're seeing the words, where do they put the money? Correct. Okay. All right. So. This is a life insurance company, Jay. All right. The best drawing like I've probably ever done. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they've got this big pool of money and we're all just living in it. Okay. It's our, it's our cash because it's a mutually owned company. So that's important to remember. But when you have a life insurance company, we each have these life insurance policies. And that's those little piles of money there are supposed to be the policies. We get a cash value. And a death benefit. Let's say one guy's got 50 grand in cash, 500 grand in death benefit. Now, the large portion of that pool has to be set aside in cash, cash allocated in case I died today. My family would get not 50 grand, but 500 grand. This is answering Annette's question as well, by the way. Now, that's that 50 grand grows guaranteed. How do they do that? How can anything be guaranteed? Well, remember, they keep my cash for the death benefit available. And if I live, I'm going to have another birthday this year. That means I'm more likely to croak next year. (laughs) This means I'm getting older. So they're saying, Hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. We don't want to pay your family 500 grand. Instead, let's increase his cash value to 60 grand. So he'll go away. So, Hey, cash surrender value. That's what it's called. So if I surrendered my policy, I'd get 60 grand instead of 50 this, this following year, as I get a year older. This continues for every year for the rest of my life because they already have my death benefit. They don't want to give it out to my family. They'd rather keep it. So they'd rather pay me to go away 60 grand mm-hmm. this year rather than 50 last year. Does that make sense? Jay, anything there not make sense? No, it makes sense. Yeah. All right. Then the rest of the money is invested, put to work in things like real estate, bonds, mortgages. This is all money that they don't have to keep in cash. So they invest that money and get yield on that capital. And if they're profitable, then they throw dividends on top of, because remember, you're the owner of this company. So you get the profits. It's a return of capital, return of premium called dividends. Dividends are not guaranteed, but they'll throw that on top. And that increases your cash value and death benefit even more. How was that? Was that? I did that all the that fastest YouTube. drawing I've ever seen put together. <laughs> that, was, that was pretty incredible. Rock and roll. Michael, I hope that answers your question. If not, um, let's, uh, I would encourage you just to sit here and or book a call with Mark and somebody from his team to kind of answer that. Cause that is, um, extremely important to know how that whole inner workings go. And I think once you talk to him, you're going to, you're going to learn so much. Every time I talk to Mark, I learn something new. Um, I learned something new. So it's, uh, it's, it's good. Every time I talk to you, Jay, I see somewhere new. Where are you calling in from today? (laughs) So we're in uh, Winter Park, Colorado. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Been here. 
been here for a few weeks. Gonna, we just extended our stay. We're going to stay here for a couple more weeks. And then uh, we don't know yet. We don't know where we're going after this. So love it. Yet, so. Awesome, man. <laughs> you know, I, I just I just love seeing where freedom is taking you. I think it's so cool. Yeah. And um, so it's, it's an, you're an example of what folks are looking for and, and working toward and reaching for. So thank you for doing what you do and helping make this group possible. Absolutely. Uh, a lot of members in here are making this whole thing possible just be, just because of bouncing ideas off of them and, hey, how would you do this? How would you do that? You're obviously a, a, a resource, a most valuable resource in, in that whole equation. I mean, you know, you and I have been working together for coming up on four years now, I think. And, wow. and okay. you know, I, I, we've been able to start a lending company with using our bank on yourself policy. Uh, now we don't have the whole cash value for the loans we're doing, but we have other cash that we're combining with that to do, do those things where we're getting, you know, 12% return on, on, on that cash that's uh, mm-hmm. basically just sitting there in the policy. So, um, however, you know, this month inside the mastermind, if you've got about five minutes, I'll, I'll, I kind of want to go through this. If not, you and I can do it later and I can record it and send it to everybody. Uh, but we're, you got five minutes? Until my daughter walks in there with a puppy in her hand saying, we got to go, <laughs> then I, I'm here. You got it? Okay. <laughs> All right. So inside the W2 Capitalist community this month, we've been talking about legacy wealth. And, and I look at you as the guy who's put my legacy on a different trajectory and so the conversations we've been having, like, it's been amazing to see where people are in different in their journey. And some people are just starting out, like they don't have a wheel. They don't have anything set up. I'm, I don't have a wheel. I do have the, the bank of yourself policy, but we get to talking about um, trust and those sorts of things. And so this is kind of what I drew up from these conversations. If I can share, um, let me share this can you see this infinite loop oh cool Mm -hmm. yeah all right so this is a a concept this is not something that actually have i've done yet and and you can see these are to be defined these are questions that are all come up one of which is not on here and probably the most important is making sure my wife is taken care of when i go to the other side of the grass as you said because i'm doing all this i'm like wait a minute you know, if I look at my family history, health history, and I look at her family health history, she's going to outlive me for like 20 years. So we got to at least, you know, so I got to go back and rework this. But the idea is we've got this Helms family trust, which is our bank, right? Talking about bank on yourself and what we do with this. And you can tell me right here in front of everybody, by the way, I didn't prep Mark for this whole <laughs> idea, but um, the idea of this Helms family trust is we set aside some money that will only fund uh, bank on yourself policies for our bloodlines, right? So we already have them with our kids, but I'm thinking about when they turn 21, maybe we convert those over or not even convert, but do another one for another massive, uh, you know, single premium policy, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But with that, in order for them to participate in the Helms Family Trust to be able to, um, fund their life insurance policy, they have to name the beneficiary of that policy as the Helms Family Trust. So that's where the money comes back into eventually into the Helms Family Trust bank. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now on the other side of this is we have qualified members in the way that uh, I'm, I'm thinking of qualifying members is there are people who have these, these policies on this side of the, the, the screen, right? Mm-hmm. If they have a policy, that names the Helms Family Trust as the beneficiary, then they can apply for a loan from the Helms Family Trust Bank, right? To purchase several things, income producing assets, start a business. There's got to be more detail that's got to be put in this, right? Love this. Yeah, it's great. And then loans are approved or denied by the Helms Family Trust board members. And, and then I get to thinking, okay, well, who are the Helms Family Trust board members? Well, it's anybody who's direct bloodline, right? So my wife or my children. Right. Or eventually mm-hmm. their children, children's not their spouses. I don't know about they. I don't know if I'm going to be a spouse because one mm-hmm. of the questions down here I have is what happens um, if someone gets incarcerated or divorced. This was a yep. this was yep. a direct bullet point that came out of a conversation with Frank. Right. And, and right now, my thought is, well, if they get incarcerated, 
they're no longer on the board and they can never take a loan right from from the Helms Family Trust. But then on any of the assets or anything the loans that purchased, the Helms Family Trust is the lien holder on that loan. Right. So Mm -hmm. while we are the lien holder on that loan, they're now paying back uh, based on whatever terms the board comes up with back into the Helms Family Trust. And there's this infinite loop of money that stays with inside Mm -hmm. the family. I love it. This is uh, this is well done. I think there's a lot lot to consider. We should have a whole nother call on this. I do do need to run, but uh, I think this is something worth talking a lot more about. In fact, there's okay. a great book on the topic. It's right behind me. It's called, it's above me here. It's uh, called okay. uh, Perpetual Wealth. Yep. Uh, and uh, it's by Kim Butler. I, I recommend folks check that book out. I I heard you mention that book in one of your podcasts and, and just because of the, the, it's my read, it's been my read for this month, just based on what we're talking about totally. inside the mastermind. So totally. uh, I understand daughter, puppy, priorities. Sure. Got sure. it. <laughs> so can I show this little puppy off here? So we got, um, yeah. Oh, we got this new little puppy just a few weeks ago. So we're, we're going to go take out. this guy out and get him on a walk. So take that out. That's you guys, awesome. have a good one. Thank you so much, Jay. Thank you, Mark. Have a good day. Appreciate you. Thank See you, buddy. Bye. Bye. All right, guys. If, as Mark drops off, if anybody, um, I want to encourage you to, to, to uh, book a call with him. If you have questions after you talk to Mark or even before you talk to Mark, if you want to talk to me about what specifically I'm doing with Bank on Yourself, and I didn't say this, and I, and Julia, next time we do one of these things, if you'll just like hit me in the head, because I think this is the third or fourth time we've done one of these with Mark, and I was like, Mark, take it away. I should introduce Mark. Mark is my certified financial planner. Uh, he's also my Bank on Yourself uh, whole life insurance uh, broker. So he's introduced me to this concept and and he helps me navigate creating this whole legacy thing. So I should have said that at the beginning. Uh, want to make sure I said that now. But if you have any questions, guys, um, and you want to ask me how I'm using, I'm going to put my uh, chat, my calendar link in the chat. Um right there go ahead and book a call uh anytime you want to uh, it's pretty open uh, just pick a spot that works for you and then i'll love to uh entertain any questions you have uh whatsoever okay thank you guys if you're here and you want to go back and watch the recording uh it'll be you'll be able to access that right where you join this session today uh inside the w2 capitalist community okay if you guys have any questions let me know and i will see you soon